بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر پارٹیسپنٹس ویلکم ٹو دس سیشن آف اسلام اسٹڈی سرکل ویل اسٹارٹ آف دس سیشن بائی ٹیکنگ آف دا فرسٹ آئٹم آف دا آف دس سیگمنٹ اینڈ وچ از قرآن سو دا قرآن ایک ورس دیٹ وی آر گوئنگ اسٹڈی ٹوڈے از فرام سورا شورا وچ از دا فورٹی سیکنڈ سورا آف دا قرآن اینڈ ورس از فورٹی ٹو فورٹی تھری ول بی انڈر ڈسکشن آئی ایم جسٹ گوئنگ ٹو ریڈ آؤٹ فرسٹ ٹیکسٹ اینڈ ٹرانسلیشن بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و جزاء سیئت سیئت مثلها فمن عفا واصلح فاجره على الله انه لا يحب الظالمين ولمن انتصر بعد ظلمه فاولئك ما عليهم من سبيل انما السبيل على الذين انما السبيل على الذين يظلمون الناس ويبغون في الارض بغير الحق اولئك لهم عذاب اليم ولمن صبر وغفر ان ذلك لمن عزم الامور and the revenge of an evil is an equal is an evil equal to it yet he who forgave and reconciled his reward rests with god indeed he does not like wrongdoers and those who took revenge after they were oppressed but then there is no blame on them the blame is only on them who oppress people and are rebellious in the land without justification it is for these people for whom there is a grievous penalty and indeed he who exercised restraint and forgave then this is from among the matters of resolve so as you can see that these are uh, some very fundamental verses and they provide some very basic guidance uh, in our everyday affairs uh, there are instances in which uh, we face rivalry there are instances in which we face animosity we face uh, the 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 heat at the heat in the heat of the moment we find that people uh, are up in a in a situation that they would try to uh, usurp our rights that they would like to harm us and this situation is something that uh, people face uh, quite often uh, in this society so uh, of course one of the uh, directives which the quran has given and which is which stands at the pinnacle of such such a situation is that if someone wrongs you then the best way is to forgive that person for that wrong and to have a, a very large heart and be magnanimous but then the quran says that this is not only possible and also there is a second option and that is if someone does evil to you you are authorized to pay back in equal coins and therefore if you do so this is perfectly okay but as the quran says that a person who does not uh, take revenge and instead of taking revenge actually the words of the quran are faman afa wa aslaha he who forg- reconciled forgave and reconciled his reward rests with god for ajruhu ala allah which means that if a person ha- had this magnanimity and this large heartedness in him to forgive people for their mistakes uh, that they were they committed against him and at the same time he did not uh, t- take revenge as a result then such is his reward that the almighty says for ajruhu ala allah that, that his reward rests with god and this is something which has a huge glad tidings for every person who has been wronged that if he forgives people for their wrong doing then remember none other but god is to is going to reward uh, him for that so for man afa wa aslaha fa ajruhu ala allah so he who forgave and reconciled his reward rests with god wala man intasara ba'da zulmihi haulaika ma alayhim min sabil and before these verses we find the almighty saying innahu la yuhibbu zalimin that he does not like those people who do wrong who are wrong doers who commit oppression who are oppressive on other people so this is something that all of us through our innate guidance we know very well that as far as uh, committing harm to other people is concerned as far as wrong them is concerned this is something which is uh, just not on and if someone does so we have been given this uh, authority and this opportunity to take the same amount of revenge and of course this does mean that the revenge uh, inflicted should not be above and beyond the wrong one has suffered and this especially uh, has special relevance i would say that in, in the arabian society in which the quran was being revealed uh, this system of vengeance and revenge it went a long way and if people were harmed in some way uh, they would end up inflicting more harm on the on the wrongdoer and this would then of course uh, start a chain reaction in which uh, a series of battles and a series of uh, conflicts and episodes of vengeance uh, would be worked up and uh, for many decades and at time centuries uh, tribes would engage in in permanent and perpetual war 
But here the Quran has given Muslims this very beautiful guidance that if they forgive, then their reward rests with God because this forgiveness, of course, would mean that they have they have ex exercised restraint and at the same time accepted very wholeheartedly that yes, someone has done wrong and they are not going to take revenge. And if this is adopted, as we have seen in history a number of times, that it stops that series of uh, vengeance and revenge battles and uh, conflicts that have raged in this world. So uh, the words go on to say, And those who took revenge after they were oppressed, then there is no blame on them. So this, is, this has a special significance as well. You see, it was, uh, it was thought that people who are religious should not take revenge and they should just forgive everything. And if they do so, then this would be a bad thing on their part. But the Quran here has said that if you take revenge, then there is no blame on such people because all that they are doing is they are exacting an equal amount from the person who was the oppressor. And this does not amount to any form of oppression in itself. On the contrary, oppression is from people who had taken the initiative uh, in wronging that person. So in the society of those days, people thought, that, well, why should a person who is, who is so religious, who is so pious, he should even think of revenge. But the Quran says, no, this is not the right way. Well, there are instances in, a person, in which a person has to resort to this revenge because of the nature of the persecution. And at the same time, also, it is at times, the, the crime committed is unforgivable. So it's not an act of oppression if you take revenge. The only thing is that it should not exceed the amount and uh, in proportion of the wrong that a person had suffered. So the Quran is absolutely clear that people who harm others, who wrong others, as, as the verse says, uh, that for such people, there is a grievous penalty uh, in the next life. And on the other hand, وَلَمَنْ sabara wa ghafara. But those who ex exercise restraint and forgave, then this is, a, of course, something of a great uh, undertaking because it's not easy when you have been wrong, when your own self-esteem has been uh, has been brutally sacrificed. Uh, it, it does it does take a lot of metal. It does take a lot of uh, courage to forgive people. Forgiveness is something. Uh, which requires a lot of bravery on the on the part of the forgiver. But then this is a target that the Almighty has set before all of us. And I, we do hope and pray that whenever we are in such a situation, we do choose this this highest uh, uh, this highest position in which we are able to forgive the offender. And as a result of that, the biggest thing that might happen is that because of this moral superiority or moral victory, that person is also reformed from inside. Now, folks, we are now going to uh, go to the next segment of uh, our study circle, which is Hadith. Uh, we are going to study a Hadith of the Prophet, and this is a Hadith from Al Jami Al Sahih of Imam uh, Muslim. And uh, the words are An Abi Huraira taqal, qala rajulun ya Rasulullah, man ahakkun nasa bi husn suhba, qala ummuka, summa ummuka, summa ummuka, summa abuk, summa adnaka adnaka. So Abu Huraira said, a person asked, O oh, Messenger of God, who amongst people is the most deserving of my good treatment? He replied, Your mother. Then again replied, Your mother. And a third time he also said, Your mother. And the fourth time he said, Then your father. And then your nearest relatives according to the order of the near, according to the order of nearness. So the more the near a person, the more should be your kindness to that person. But uh, needless to say, the the right of the mother is is underscored here, and it, the way it has been underscored is that it has the uh, mother has three times more right on a on a son or a, or a daughter than the father is himself, and this is quite understandable, uh, dear listeners, because of the fact that the amount of uh, suffering and, and the amount of sacrifice which with a, with which a mother undergoes is is far exceeds it far exceeds the father. A mother, first of all, carries uh, in her womb for nine months. And he, and during that time, she is, of course, burdened and she's, of course, pushed to her ultimate limits. And then that at the time of childbirth as well, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a life and death situation in most, on most occasions. And she goes through that too. And thirdly, she is also the person who suckles the young child. So these are three things which the father has not, I mean, he does not undertake or undergo. So it does seem very, very appropriate, uh, the, the Prophet pointing this out in this narrative that your mother has three 
rights, thrice those rights as a father. And this also shows the great amount of respect as we all must have for our parents. We know that uh, it is needless to say that parents command respect. Of course, this is something which is inbuilt. It is something that we have in our own self, but uh, it still needs to be reminded because at times this is something that we tend to overlook. It, we tend, it tends to elude us. But uh, Prophet in such uh, sublime words has said that, well, the right of your mother is such that you must see that the amount of sacrifice and difficulty she has put herself into is such that you just cannot repay her. It's simply out of the question. But what you can do is be kind, be affectionate, and also realize that this is something which the Almighty in his grand scheme of things has, has sanctioned in a way that the unit and the system of the family, when it comes into being, it has to come into being with the union of a father and a mother. And in this regard, the, the, the mother has this uh, special standing. Uh, needless to say that at times parents themselves uh, don't realize that uh, they become oppressive to their children. They, 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 they persecute, I mean, I would not say persecute them, but I would say that they will certainly uh, impose themselves in, a such, in such a vehement manner that uh, it does damage the psyche of the children. So on the one hand, yes, children have to be extremely respectful uh, towards their parents. And as this narrative also says that in the extended family as well. But on the other hand, parents too, they must also realize this fact that as far as their life is concerned, as far as their connection with their children is concerned, they have to teach their children uh, as best as they can. But ultimately, they must not enforce their own will on their children. Children, I'm talking about grown-up children, once they enter into mature age, into grown-up age, now it is their life that needs to be understood and they must be given this freedom and leverage. Yes, parents can share their experience, they can be very good advisors, but they have to realize that as far as forcing their own decision on their children is concerned, this is something which the Almighty has not allowed. And uh, as I have said, in some of our other sessions that this amounts to actually a violation of human rights because as a human being, as an adult human being, every person has been invested with this right of making decisions on his, uh, on his or her, her own discretion. Let us now move on to the third segment of our study circle and this is Bible verse of the day. Today we are going to study verses 41 to 42, 44 uh, on, from chapter number 12 of the Gospel of Mark. And he, Jesus, took a seat by the place where the money was kept and saw how people put money into the boxes. And a number who had wealth put in much. And a number who had wealth put in much. And there came a poor widow, and she put in two little bits of money, which make a farthing. And he made his disciples come to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are putting money into the box because they are all, they all put in it something out of what they had no need for. But she out of her own need put all that she had. She out of her own need put in all she had, even all her living. So this is something which is very extraordinary, which Jesus in his very sublime style, as we see how subtly and how eloquently he uses situations, he uses incidents, every everyday life is incidents, and make them a means of teaching his disciples. And as you can see from this incident that people were filling the coffers, they were filling a box, like a money box that was meant for charity. And on most occasions, people were putting in the spare money that they had. But Jesus pointed out to a widow, and she was not just putting her spare money, she was actually putting the money that she needed. And she was not shying away, even if she had little. And in fact, they, she was in, in fact displaying a tremendous amount of selflessness uh, by, while doing so. And that is precisely what, what Jesus has said here. He said, that, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are putting money into the box. So if you put all those people together who are uh, contributing for charity, uh, Prophet Jesus says that, well, if they are enumerated on one on the one hand and the money put in by the widow uh, on the other hand then the poor widow is, will still outweigh them because she gave her gave the money what she required what she had for her for her needs and the rest they were giving what they did not require and it was fair spare for them this is the spirit my dear viewers that we all need to understand 
that there, there are times in this uh, in this world, in this uh, temporary world, in this transient world, when you have to realize that it's not just uh, the, the assets and the wealth and the things that we possess which are going to make any difference in our lives. It's basically what we do for others is going to be stored up in heavens and in, in, in the exchequer of God and going to be returned to us many fold. So let us find solace and refuge in thinking about others, in spending for them, even if we have little, even if we have small. Uh, you'll find divine scriptures speaking of this selflessness in such lofty words. Uh, on one occasion, the Quran has also said that the highest form of charity is one in which you give in spite of being in need. So the Quran says, Yusirun ala anfusihim walaukana bihim kasasa. Such are these, these noble people that in spite of being in need of the money they might be spending, they give preference, priority to other people. And this is the spirit. It's, it's uh, undoubtedly something of a tall order. But then if you have that connection with God, if you feel that you're living in this world and you're going to reap some rewards in the hereafter, this passion, this, this uh, feeling gives you the power to spend on other people and to always think about their needs, always put their needs before our own needs. And at the same time, realize that if we have been blessed by the Almighty, we were not entitled to these blessings. It's just that the Almighty has chosen us to see whether what we do with these blessings and the best way uh, to deal with these blessings, to help with these blessings is to share them at, in, a, in a very wide way to all our all the people who might be around us. And for that, we need to have that eye. We need to have that air in which we are able to spot people who are in need. And as Jesus has said, that look, if you, if you do so, then your reward is, is, is something that you would not even imagine that's going to come from God. And in this particular area, it is something of a, of a, of a guidance in a, such a lofty way that he has provided us and he has uh, repeatedly, I mean, if you study the Bible, if you study the Gospels, there are so many occasions in which he uses these everyday incidents, these happenings to teach people, to open the door to reality to people. And you can see that this is something that we can also do. If we have eyes, if we have discerning eyes, if we have keen eyes, we can learn these lessons from people around us, people who are unsung heroes, people who might not be prominent. But the way they, and the mannerism in, the, in which they live life, in which they discharge their duties, makes them outstanding exponents of humanity. So now we come to, an, to the end of uh, our third segment of our study circle, and we are now going to have a discussion on, uh, on a topic, and which is going to be moderated. So the topic today is the advantages and the disadvantages of social media. Of course, in this in this. Uh, era in which there is this explosion, this social media explosion, as, as people say, knowledge explosion in which uh, we are living through apps, we are living through our phone, a phone has become a home to us, a phone has become an office to us, uh, we even use it in our, in our, in our bathrooms, we take it along uh, with us wherever we go, it's like an uh, inseparable part of our, of our existence. So in, these, in this background, we must also take stock of the situation and see what are the advantages and disadvantages of social media. So over to you, uh, Mariam, if you are there. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Uh, I'll start off the discussion. So for me, what I really like about social media is that you are exposed to different perspectives from all kinds of people. And that really helps you broaden your ideas and you know, if you have any preconceived notions or if you want to learn about something new, you can really, really do that there. But the, the one con to this becomes that a lot of people stay stuck to their bubble that they're comfortable with. And so it could mm. end up, you know, being the complete opposite where you're just in, in a sort of an echo chamber where you're hearing the same perspective that you'd like to hear. And so you don't end up learning something new. So it could go both ways. And I think like a lot of things with social media, it really depends on how you're using it because at the end of the day, it's, a, right. it's an important tool to have um, and it depends on the user. Okay, that is fine. But one thing that we have often seen is that it is very, very addictive. And this, uh, this the, the way things are progressing uh, with the introduction of uh, chat GPT and then AI uh, stepping in, uh, we are bound to have a tremendous impetus in the nature of uh, social interaction. And now 
hello, uh, holograms and uh, things like image travel have become so uh, possible a reality that uh, the more we develop uh, these apps and these uh, instruments of social media, the more involved we are going to get in them, which has a telling effect on human relations, I would say. So this is one area that has to be looked into. Thank you, Dr. Slim. Um, for those who'd like to participate in discussion, please feel free to raise your hands and we'll go in the order that they're received. Um, until then, in terms of chat GPT, I could say that I've found it a useful tool sometimes in, in terms of searching for some information. And also, you know, if you want to start brainstorming about writing some sentences, it really helps you get over the writer's block. Um, as long as obviously you're not copy pasting, that would be plagiarism, but you're right. changing around some stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's a, it's, it's a fun tool um, if used properly mm -hmm. or... Mm -hmm. If used not properly, then students are, some students, they don't end up learning anything. So I think mm -hmm. instead of, there there was a time where some universities were trying to put a sort of a stop or like stopping their students from using it, but it could do more harm than good because it's hard to catch unless you have some other specific tools to catch people mm -hmm. using chat GPT or other AI. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. more important to learn how to use it. There's someone in the comments who said that chat GPT is reducing creativity. Mm -hmm. Is it? Well, because chat GPT itself is the product of creativity. Oh, we have a raised hands. Isabel Aisha Khalid, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would like to comment on the same point that ChatGPT might reduce creativity because, as for example, uh, I like to do poetry all the time. And I was sitting here with my friend and I was showing her uh, a poem or a piece of novel that I was working on. And she said, you know, it's not a big deal. She wrote in ChatGPT and she wrote some uh, lines of her thought that, uh, can you create me a poem having these, these, these points? And it created for her. And it was literally free of any plagiarism. And mm. at that time, I just felt that, oh, my God, I think maybe not only it's resting creativity, but it's also lessening the worth of original work because it kind of is good in producing uh, being an AI on generating better stuff than we do as better poems or better stories and stuff. Right. So that is also understandable that, uh, I mean, although it, it doesn't plagiarize because of the fact that ChatGPT itself is a work of creativity and it has its own creativity as well. So it has started to create uh, things that you just cannot imagine. And, and at times what it comes up with is so amazing. It's so astonishing that you keep, you start to wonder that how, how on earth is this possible? So yes, I think this uh, ChatGPT is something which, uh, I mean, on the one hand, it might reduce your creativity because you just become addictive to it. You think that instead of thinking yourself, all that you need to do is you feed uh, the, the, the pointers and it will come up with something creative itself. Uh, but then, as I said, on the other hand, uh, if you look at some of the other areas in which speed, efficiency, time become uh, factors of consideration, uh, it might be extremely helpful also. And as we can see that this is just the beginning. I mean, we are just uh, at the very beginning, a very start of this, uh, this happening and God knows where we're going to end. But the real thing, I think, which we need to uh, re-evaluate maybe and revisit is the lack of human element, which the social media, I mean, whatever the form uh, we talk about, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or uh, so many other things like TikTok, etc. Uh, I mean, it, it is uh, subtracting that human connection, uh, which at times is is very telling. And you're sitting in the same room, have you gone to visit someone, maybe an elderly person, uh, to inquire about that person's health, and you end up <laughs> concentrating more on your phone. And maybe the person who is sick also, he or she's also concentrating more on the phone, and you're sitting right across one another. So yes, it becomes comical as well at times. But I think we, uh, I mean, this is this is something as if you have found a, a treasure or something which is super exciting, and you become so involved in that that you just tend to forget normal human behavior and normal human relation. And this does happen. 
So I think that uh, with time, this might normalize. Otherwise, at, uh, at a very earlier age, when our children are growing up, and at a very earlier age, I mean, like maybe two years or three years, it is at this age that they are, they start picking up these gadgets and just start typing on them and they become uh, gadget savvy. So I think maybe this is the time in which we need to sort of uh, make them realize that, yes, this is part of our lives. It has a lot of advantages, but it has to be used prudently. Although, as I said, prudence doesn't come uh, until you, I mean, until you go to certain extremes, or only when then you realize that, well, you're across the limits, now you should go back. So, I mean, I, I have just this, these mixed feelings. I cannot, I mean, give you an exact maybe solution, but I do think that the biggest thing that we need to work on is uh, this sacrifice uh, that human relations have uh, been made to suffer. Thank you, Dr. Slim. Um, I'd like to comment on one aspect of chat GPT. Uh, so all of these AI tools, they take existing information, whatever was fed to them, and then they string them together. And, and, and the creativity here is in terms of how they string those things, all, all this, all that information together to make it sound very right. human-like, but it's not actually creating any original work um, or it's, mm -hmm. it's not thinking for itself. So... I just mm -hmm. wanted to add that there. Whereas humans, absolutely, one yeah. could argue. <laughs> so if we don't have any more uh, raised hands for the discussion, we could move over to the Q&A. Oh, Sabine Ra, please go ahead. Right. Assalamualaikum, shukriya. Social media ke baare mein maine ye kena tha ki zyada tar jo maine baat dekhi hai, wo ye hai ki be pardagi bo to ye. आप जिस तरह इस्तेमाल करें इसमें कोई शक नहीं कि आप जिम्मेदार हैं कि क्या आप कर रहे हैं पीछे लेकिन जो जिस चीज पे अल्लाह ताला ने पर्दा रखा हुआ था छोटी सी छोटी सी चीज हो वो भी आज आपको नजर आती है जैसे एक नॉर्मल सी बात है नॉर्मल सा एक्शन है और ये ऐसा फीलिंग होता है कि जो गलत भी है वो भी ठीक हो रहा है और ज्यादातर फिर इस तरह के रिएक्शन नजर आते हैं बच्चों में कि वो वही काम करते हैं वही बातें कहते हैं उनको ये भी नहीं महसूस होता कि क्या अच्छा है क्या नहीं और ये है कि एक वक्त में ये था कि अगर अल्लाह तला आप पे रहम करते थे कि आपकी गलती या एक ऐसा काम है जो सबको शया नहीं होया सबके सामने अब ऐसा है कि सबके सामने आ जाता है तो इस पे थोड़ा सा न, वाले निशानिया निशानी है कि क्या वाकई ही चीज है या नहीं एक्चुअली सी वी डू गेट योर पॉइंट व्हाट यू आर सेइंग दैट इट्स द यूज ऑफ अ थिंग व्हिच मेक्स इट क्वेश्चनेबल सो जस्ट एज दीस गैजेट्स हैव ट्रेमेंडस एडवांटेजेस बेनिफिट्स देयर रॉन्ग यूज इज गोइंग टू इनेविटेबली लीड अस टू ग्रेट पिटफॉल्स so uh, but the, the fact is that they are present in our environment in such a all embracing way that if you start to check your children maybe or youngsters to or impose restrictions uh, i do feel that this does not might not work because uh, how far you can go it's it's like air that you breathe it's so common so i think maybe a better way out is to make them realize it's their harms it's harms and how it can inflict afflict them and uh, after some trial and error which they're going to do in any case experimentation uh, if they make mistakes they're going to realize themselves so it does seem to me that when when evil or when bad things are uh, is are they are i mean they are selective you have to choose between them it's easy to control them but when they are everywhere i mean they're like air to you you have to breathe in and breathe out then it's become so difficult to impose restrictions and perhaps in such a situation a better alternative uh, would be to create this awareness amongst uh, our own selves in the first place and of course amongst our children as well that how these things can negatively affect our uh, our mental health so you see one one important area that we need to always concentrate is this mental health issue so uh, addiction towards anything is going to severely affect our mental health is going to impair it also at the same time you know responsibilities that might be imposed on us they they might tend to get neglected and so on and so forth so i think uh, i mean making people aware of the harms and especially when they themselves also experiment and they suffer these harms perhaps 
that is how uh, we human beings generally learn it's not always that we learn from the mistakes of others on most occasions we make those mistakes and then we realize that well we should not repeat them so yes i do agree that uh, it has caused a, such nuisance and has caused a lot of uh, things that we would that would be upsetting but then i think the important way is to how to deal with these this uh, because you just cannot reverse the cycle the time cycle has is going to go on and on it's uh, in fact it's going to i mean increase it's going to enhance in intensity so i think that we uh, as parents as ad- elders as part as responsible citizens of the globe we need to devise strategies in which we are able to not only benefit from these ad- advancements of science i call it an advancement of science a science but at the same time also uh, to protect ourselves from its evil effects Thank you Dr. Salim. Isabel Aisha Khalid, please go ahead. Okay, so um you said that how social media is deeply embedded and actually pretty much mummified our all of our society. And then you also talked about mental illness and how we have to deal with them. So it just clicked into my mind as Snapchat is having a very wild use in Pakistan since the time we were exposed to it. And what I have seen with the passage of time that instead of catching some maturity, especially in girls, they are going into more complex issues like nobody is ready to take a picture in majority i'm speaking with a simple camera unless it's too much outstanding so how can we deal with such issues as we can see it's a lot and we can just say by looking that okay it's a uh, complex that you're afraid to show your real face or the camera cannot picture it well but actually i think mm-hmm. it starts eating like uh, the small termites a personality mm-hmm. from inside and weakens a person in which they can't even they're not knowing and their whole personality is trembling so how can right. we uh, fight this disease which is going to also together all in all in the society Yes absolutely right uh, this is something of this is one of the biggest uh, negativities which uh, this thing is producing that uh, i mean everything is be- has become so superficial and the outside looks uh, they have replaced all values and uh, i mean people don't don't pay attention to what a person is from inside and all that comes into question and all that comes into discussion is one's physical appearance and how one sh- should dress up etc and uh, this is something which is of course quite uh, quite a big trial because i mean the almighty has not made every person uh, pleasing in the in, in his or her looks and people have are all, all types and this has caused a lot of uh, mental health issues amongst boys and girls who might not have who might think that they don't have uh, i mean they don't have that appearance that some of the other people might have and this has caused them to i mean this has brought them to limelight uh, formerly they were hidden they were i mean in the society but now suddenly because of the prominence of some beautiful faces some of the people who don't have those faces or looks they feel uh, deprived they feel depressed and they feel that uh, i mean maybe god is, has been unkind to them and as a result what happens is that instead of concentrating on your own skill set you more you concentrate more on your appearance and your outward look my uh, submission here would be that one of the uh, counter measures that we can take is is the, is the one that i just suggested and that is to always feel proud of the skill set that you have so god has created people with different skill sets and these skill sets are worth being proud of uh, you might have uh, abilities in in various affairs you could be a good writer or a good singer or a good uh, elocutor or a, a good uh, speaker good teacher uh, a person who is a philanthropist i mean there's so many aspects of a personality so i think every person should concentrate on the on the points and the skills are said that he has or she has been given by god and 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 regard himself or herself to be a worthy individual who can contribute to the betterment of the society and and should not participate in this rat race which has started uh, and as i said it is causing more harm and people have i mean gone to extremes like we have suicides we have severe mental issues in which because of these uh, this external this stress on external appearance Uh, a lot of people they just tend to neglect a lot of other things that they might have uh, as skills but i mean the skill which has now become so prominent which is the outer appearance maybe they don't have that but the fact is that this causes uh, a lot of uh, frustration in them so as i said concentration on one skill set 
concentration on what what good I can bring to the society. It's not always looks that are going to matter. It's how you fare in this world, how you bring happiness in this world, how you can contribute in the lives of other people, which matters. And the biggest happiness that comes our way is the happiness that you create by making other people happy. So I think by stressing out the fact that uh, contribution in this world and uh, having emphasis on our own skill set will bring that, that confidence, that self-esteem, which at times gets damaged because of this rat race, as I said. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. That was it for all of the raised hands. Uh, one, a couple more points I'd like to add uh, to the discussion. So, you know, echoing what Isabel uh, basically said about Snapchat, there is this huge problem of TikTok here in America where, you know, teenagers are going sort of through the same thing or younger adults um, in terms of TikTok. And like you said, focusing on skill set is very important. And I think one more thing to add to that is that your looks are not going to last. At some point, you're going to grow old and they're going to fade mm -hmm. away. And that's true for everyone. So I think as as you start aging, you start realizing those those matters. And right. if you have and if you're a parent or an elderly person who can guide the younger people and tell them that looks are temporary, but your skill sets and your knowledge and They're all permanent. that is permanent. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So that could be Absolutely. a huge uh, boost. Um, one more mm -hmm. thing I wanted to bring into discussion is the spread of misinformation through social media. So, mm -hmm. you know, how would you, uh, how would you counteract that? I think, uh, again, we have to be more self-reflective -refle and uh, self, I mean, self-accountability, as I would say, uh, this is the one that checks us. And that is that, I mean, you just cannot spread information which is, uh, which is, which cannot be verified. So if social media is spreading information, the greatest impact that which this has is that people tend to believe what, whatever comes their way and they start discussing uh, facts as if they have already happened. And the next thing that they know is it's just a fake thing that has come their way. So people have to be very cautious in, uh, in uh, catching information in having it verified and before reporting it to, to other people. So because time and again, we have realized that uh, fake news and uh, incorrect facts, they, they just go out. And I mean, people just don't realize that how things are doctored, how they are made up and, and a whole malicious propaganda is, is spread. In fact, uh, this is something which political parties and social groups, they also use against one another. So we have to be cautious because you see, it's not, I mean, it's difficult to, <laughs> to advise other people. All that we need to do is perhaps advise our own self and be self accountable in this matter that, well, whatever information comes our way, we will only uh, believe in it or maybe transmit it if it of, 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 uh, of some consequence when we have verifiable means, when we are able to know that, yes, this is something that we can trust. And there, until that, we will not be, I mean, we'll not be gullible. We'll not just believe in whatever comes our way. So I think it's a question of setting right our own attitude. And if every person realizes this, then uh, I mean, it's he or she at the end of the day is going to either suffer because of that wrong reporting or be in peace because he or she would think that, well, well, things did come our way, but uh, because we had no verifiable information. Uh, so, okay, I mean, you're not just going to have an opinion, not form an opinion on the basis of it. I would say the best thing is that self-realization and, uh, and sifting out uh, attitude that we must possess. And, and I mean, you just cannot have that power to control social media. That's a huge thing. But you do have the power to control your own self. Thank you, Dr. Salim. That was it for all the discussion points. Unless somebody has something else to add to the discussion, we'll move over to the Q&A. So please raise your hand if you, if you have any questions. Um, until then, we have a question uh, of a participant who asked about um, Ahl al-Ta'if and how Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made a dua for them and that then helped them prosper. Is this true? Yes, it has been reported in books of Hadith and history that when he went there, uh, he's, I mean, he was persecuted, he was pelted upon with stones, he became, I mean, he had blood running over his uh, whole body and in spite of uh, getting angry and maybe 
uh, I mean, th- saying that, well, oh God, destroy these people. Uh, he actually made these words. He actually supplicated before the Almighty that uh, please don't destroy this nation because from their loins, another nation is going to come into being who's going to be and more understanding. And at the same time, I think he also said that these people don't know me that well, and that is why they are behaving in this way. So I think that this is a golden example of the prophet in which instead of, uh, re- I mean, retaliating, uh, at, in the face of utmost persecution, he uh, he was more, I mean, he, he was much more concerned of the people who were inflicting this harm on them, and he was praying for them. And he, he knew that, well, because of the fact that they have been misinformed, maybe, or they're not rightly behaving, one day they're going to change their attitude. And I think this happened, I mean, it's because of his patience and perseverance that uh, that it, it the tide uh, turned on them. And uh, we find how how vehemently they then later on sided with, with the Prophet. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Isabel Aisha Khalid, please go ahead. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. So uh, should I go one by one or just place them all together? You can I think go, go on one, one by, by one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So my first question is that uh, there was a time when I accepted Christianity. And the reason was this, that uh, the religion I knew was just, there was too much gymnastics done with it. And it was so much orthodox and it didn't make any sense to me before I knew Vandi Sahab. And what I felt is that God is more like a tyrant who is waiting to find a mistake in us and punish us for that. But when I studied the Bible and the Torah, I found out that God is very merciful. But later on then, uh, God bless Hamdi Sahab, I came back to my religion. But what there is a thing that still bugs me and I still feel too much lacking. And that is that in the Bible and in the Torah, God shows his love to the people who are believed as my firstborn, my chosen one, and so mm-hmm. many more endless ways it's called mm-hmm. calls the Israelites. But in the Quran, there's not so much of the expression, or maybe I I I can't perceive it that maximum is ya ibadi or ya ayyuhaladina amanu so is it that maybe God loved them more than us or maybe giving them too much love didn't work out quite well so God isn't doing that with us well you see uh, the message of all books of God has been the same ever since the inception of mankind ever since Adam to Muhammad all scriptures uh, we have we are told by the Quran they have brought the same religion very, there very minor differences in in the, in things uh, that have taken place, and that too because of uh, an evolution of societies and civilization. Otherwise, morals and faith uh, articles they have always been the same in uh, in these divine religions. And you'll find this, uh, the Torah and the Quran similar in one aspect, and that is some harsh things are spoken. I mean, in the Torah speaks of those harsh things reg- regarding the Israelites, and the Quran actually recounts those. Uh, I mean, it, it, it charge sheets the Israelites and tells them that how they have misbehaved with their own prophet Moses and how earlier on, even with, uh, after the times of Abraham, how they, 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 they did not carry on the mission that was given to them. They regard themselves to be chosen, but then they went to the other extreme and started to persecute other people. Yeah, and you find the Quran also replete with such uh, instances in which the people of the book and the idolaters, they are taken to task. So I think what we need to understand is that mercy is present in both books of God. But as far as the harsh part of these books is concerned, uh, they are, it is basically directed to people uh, against whom the Almighty had to set up a court of justice in this world. They had to be punished in this world. So we have been discussing this law of Itmamul Hujjah, or law of messengerhood, uh, which is uh, found in the Quran and in the Old Testament, which is the Torah, that people of the messengers of God, his, their foremost addressees, they are punished in this world for their wrongdoing and for their denial of the truth, because it is intentional. It is not out of any ignorance or any misinformation. So this intentional denial of the truth is punished in this world and that punishment is going to continue in the hereafter as well. So because of the fact that the Quran basically deals with the idolaters and the people of the book who are the the opposing group or the opposing uh, factions against the message of the Prophet. So it tells them that if you 
accept faith because this is something that you had promised yourself in your own book bears witness to fact the fact that whenever the last prophet would come you would profess faith and help him now you are now that the last prophet has come uh, it's the it's time for you to honor your promise so if you do so you will be of course rewarded and if you don't do so then then the, that promise of doom and destruction which was made in the torah is going to continue so because of the fact that the quran is a book of this uh, final uh, i would say rep- final report on the fact that how nations who get, who intentionally deny god's prophets and messengers they are they are taken to task that you find such verses in in the quran as well and as i said if you read the torah in more detail you'll find uh those verses in them as well and even in in the in the gospels you'll find jesus reprimanding the, uh, the romans of his times and how they had indulged in paganism and how they had uh, at times just left the original guidance and also reprimanded all the israelites as well that uh, they and he has reported to have said that he has come to to complete the book and he's not come to revoke it so it's just a question of having this background in mind that all these books of god they speak of god's mercy but at the same time they also speak of his wrath because of the fact that god says that with that punishment in the hereafter if that is true if that's going to take place then you will see a small glimpse of that in this world as well so that that eternal punishment or their punishment in the hereafter you don't forget it you you don't lose sight of it so it's just a question of i think uh, reading these scriptures with this with this uh, law in, in in the background okay thank you so much it's it's much clear now okay so my second question is also like to the first so when i accepted christianity actually i am an author so i was working on a novel and different books so what i did is i uh, put a lot of christianity beliefs in it and i even ended one with the concept of a uh, crucifixion and salvation in blood of jesus and on the second hand uh, i was uh, i'm having contact with a jewish community because we're kind of family friends so i would write worship songs and some of them even for messianic jewish community so uh, what is it now i really regret on doing it but i just can't bring it back or i can't cancel the content that i written or the songs that i wrote and uh, will i be held kind of accountable if uh, they're still singing it even if i i made it pretty clear of my faith and secondly this that it has been my desire uh, to sing the worship songs the psalms with them in hebrew and english but now that uh, since i'm back in my religion and even kind of trying to preach it we know that in our societies people don't i female singing quite good and although it's worship singing or not so what would be your a uh, suggestion about that well first of all whatever you did in the past is something that is behind you now i mean if you think that you wrote something uh which you don't su- subscribe to any longer as far as you yourself uh is concerned i think you do stand clear but if people are still doing something that you created now it is i mean they it's a, it's a matter between themselves and their uh, and and god so i don't think you need to feel any any guilt for that because you see a person is what he is now or she is now so uh, whatever you did in the past uh, i mean you have just you have come a long way from that and uh, as far as uh, worship songs are concerned we also need to understand it as as long as they don't have any element of polytheism in it uh i mean as, as you clearly mentioned the, the psalms for example you don't find any polytheistic uh, semblance even the semblance of polytheism in, in the psalms so singing the psalms for example or maybe writing songs which are similar to the psalms is absolutely perfectly okay i would say even now and the last part that you said was that yes in our society uh women if they take up this uh, of this this task of singing uh, whether it's worship songs or whether it's uh, non worship songs uh regardless they are looked down upon and something which is a culturally a stigma on on a on a lady or a girl or a woman yes that is a, a sad story a sad fact but as i said you 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 need to do what you can do best and if you're if you think that what you're doing is contributing for your own growth and you're also some, doing something which is uh in line with 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 god's likeness and it's also something which is in line with your own conscience then i think it's question of weighing the alternatives that you have and i would say that 
Uh, I mean, it's perfectly okay if you continue with them, but yes, there are situations in which might you might need to reconsider because not because the thing is wrong, but because the way it ha- it is perceived in the society is is something uh, which might cause some difficulty. So it's like a question of managing uh, what the talent that you have and also thinking how best you can put it to use. Uh, thank you so much. About <laughs> as you said about that, the Psalms they are. monotheistic fully especially the psalms of david but when in the christian community they are singing the psalms they are usually thinking of jesus as for example the word uh, jesus hebrew name is yeshua that means salvation and wherever the word is used in the psalms especially in the psalms of david they take it that actually david is ex- is addressing yeshua prophet jesus so if i'm thinking with any messianic but i'm having my own belief that i'm talking to god as my right. yeshua mm-hmm. not jesus mm-hmm. but that person is seeking jesus so will right. it be wrong or something no it's not be wrong because you see you yourself have this uh, i mean strong feeling that you're talking to god you're not talking to yeshua you're not talking to jesus at all it's 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 all a question of your intention So if they are doing something which is contrary to what you are doing, I mean, let them do what they are doing. But as if you are doing it by considering the fact that you are addressing God uh, as your Lord uh, in all these psalms, uh, uh, it's, it's perfectly okay. And in fact, uh, there is nothing which could be better than that. I mean, when you are reading the psalms, it uh, it's it it comes to your own heart. It they strike a chord in in your own heart and mind that it's such a beautiful prayer of uh, of help and support that you that you would like God you, to give you. So, if in your mind you you have God uh, a picture that yes, you are addressing all these psalms to Him, I find it to be the best possible option. Thank you so much. It really helped. I think that was it for all the questions. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Salim. Okay. Inshallah, you see much. you in textual study of the Quran tomorrow.